Hello everyone. A couple of small announcements before we begin. First off, please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent. That'd be greatly appreciated. Second of all, it's Public Libraries Week, which is big for us. So between 12 and 4 every day, we will be uh, serving coffee and talking to you about library events upstairs in the lobby. And this weekend is our big used book sale. So come and support the library and get some knowledge. Also, the CATS committee will be doing their bake sales so you can feed your mind and your body with sweets. So October 26th and 27th at 11 o'clock. We also have the discovery of the art of bonsai on Sunday at 11 o'clock. So you can go pick up some books and then watch us trim some trees. And my final announcement is that the date for next uh, month's Dr. Joe will actually be on November the 11th and not the 4th as we previously announced. Those are all the announcements and here without further ado is Dr. Joe with Science Demystified. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I see that we're starting to get back to pre-COVID numbers here, right? Which, which is good. It seems like the world is sort of returning to, uh, to normal. <clears throat> All right. Part of our world, of course, is that we eat. And uh, unfortunately, the fact is that we are often confused by what we should or should not eat. That is thanks to the social media, uh, from where so many people get their information these days. And one day we're told that it's butter that's killing us, right? So you've got to stay away from butter, switch to margarine, and then we find out that it's actually margarine that's doing us in. So you say, hell with both of those, just forget eating butter or margarine. Until you pick up your Time magazine and it turns out that butter is back in vogue, so we can eat it once more. And so it goes with so many of the different foods. Sugar, sugar, you know, is poison, right? So you say, hell with that, we're not going to eat sugar. we we'll switch to artificial sweeteners. So we start putting that into our coffee. We start drinking diet drinks with artificial sweeteners. And then we find out that those artificial sweeteners are destroying our gut microbiome. And everyone these days, of course, is talking about the microbiome, that uh, diverse family of microbes that live in our gut that we now find out are not just bystanders. They actually play an active role in our welfare. We're still not exactly sure which are the so-called good microbes and which are the bad ones. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of exciting research in that area. You know, we're, we're all looking to the uh, yogurts that have uh, active bacteria in them, hoping that they will have some benefit. And uh, eventually we may tease out exactly which microbes are necessary and, and which are not. So anyway, all right, so we're not going to drink those diet drinks, but we're told we should be drinking milk because of all the calcium and strengthen our bones until you look at the latest scientific research and you find out that, you know, that isn't so good, that actually drinking milk increases your risk of, uh, of fractures. <clears throat> then we're told, eat as many fish as you can, right? Because fish are full of omega-3 fats, and those are great. Uh, you give it to pregnant women, and they give birth to children with higher IQs. But then you discover that those fish harbor mercury and PCBs. So say, whoa, I better limit the amount of fish that we eat. And so it goes. So we live in a world that is full of confusion. And uh, it's not surprising that people are unsure, they're puzzled and confused by uh, what they should or should not eat. But luckily, we have people like the food babe to lead us out of this uh, wilderness. Food babe has a huge presence on social media. Uh, he, she has not had a huge presence in any educational institution, 
Uh, she is educated at the University of Google, uh, and I suspect she has even failed that. But she's a very good looking lady, and she talks a good game. And uh, people follow her because she sort of presents herself as the champion of the common person uh, and is going to tell us how big food, big pharma, big cosmetics are all in cahoots with each other to do us in, and she's there to save us. So, for example, she will attack this chemical, although, of course, she has never seen that molecular structure. She wouldn't understand what that is. But it is azodicarbonamide, and this is one of her pet peeves. Now, this is a chemical that is used uh, in some bakery goods, uh, in some breads, uh, more specifically in the rolls that Subway uses. And this has resulted in her attacking Subway. Now, first of all, what is azyl dicarbonamide and what's it doing? The reason that it is in baked goods is because when it is heated, it releases nitrogen, and that causes the baked goods to rise. It basically does the same job as, as yeast, but it does it in a much more predictable way, so they know exactly how much the dough will, will rise. There's no issue with azyl dicarbonide. When it breaks down, it just releases nitrogen and carbon dioxide and, and water. However, uh, this brilliant person has also somehow discovered that azocarbonamide is used to make yoga mats, which is true. Yoga mats are made of plastic, but they're made of foam. Now, how do you make a foam? You make a foam by bubbling some sort of gas into the plastic as it hardens so that you get bubbles inside. That's what a foam is. So you can make yoga mats with any substance that, that can release gas. You could, in fact, make it with yeast. You could make it with baking powder. But it turns out that making it with azyl dicarbonamide is an easy way and a reproducible way to do it. But to her, this, of course, means that they're using a chemical that is used to make yoga mats in your subway rolls. And therefore, when you're eating at Subway, you might as well be eating a yoga mat. This is her interpretation of the science. And then, in a bizarre fashion, she goes on TV, on the morning shows, uh, because, of course, they like this idea of reading yoga mats, and she actually eats yoga mats in this stupid fashion, of course, not really understanding that she's undermining whatever she's actually uh, saying. But her message is that this dastardly industry is filling us with this horrific chemical, um, which is going to result in death in the supermarket aisles. <clears throat> now, the fact is that whenever a food additive is used, it has gone through all the regulatory hoops and hurdles. This is not a question of, of uh, the industry deciding, gee, you know, we'd like to put some azyl dicarbonamide into the food. That's not how it works. You have to show what it is, why you're using it. You have to demonstrate that it has actually been studied in, in, in animals and uh, in the laboratory, and that uh, there's no reason to think that there's any uh, safety issue with it. And there isn't with azyl dicarbonamide. But of course, you can create a story uh, which makes it sound horrific and tell people that you know, you're eating something that is used to make yoga mats. But so what? I mean, it's the same kind of idea. It's, it's, are you going to be scared from taking a calcium carbonate supplement because calcium carbonate is also used to make gravestones? Right? I mean, it's the same kind of nonsensical uh, uh, argument. Uh, but talking about such nonsensical arguments, our pal, the food babe, uh, tells us that we should also be staying away from Cheerios. Uh, why? Because of a particular additive in there, which is trisodium phosphate. And why should we staying, be staying away from Cheerios? Because trisodium phosphate 
is a heavy duty cleaning agent, which of course it is. And when you take a look at the uh, MSDS, the material safety data sheet for trisodium phosphate, it will indeed tell you that you can get abdominal pain and burning sensation, shock, etc. And this, she says, is what they're pulling into your Cheerios. Well, she's right about one thing, is that it is put into the Cheerios. Uh, however, the fact that it also happens to be a cleaning agent has nothing to do with why it is being put into, into Cheerios. The amount is trivial. It is a tiny amount that is put into, uh, into Cheerios. And there are a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one, it is, it is a pH modifier. Uh, it's trisodium phosphate is actually an alkaline material. And uh, you don't want the dough out of which the Cheerios is made to become too acidic because then it begins to crumble. So essentially it keeps the texture. Now trisodium phosphate is a very commonly used uh, food ingredient. It is used in many different foods. It's used in ham, for example, and other cold cuts to keep moisture in. Now, in that case, there is actually somewhat of a nefarious reason. The reason that they put it in there is because it holds on to moisture so that they can sell you water for the price of meat. Uh, however, uh, it is also used in a large variety of other foods because it also acts as an emulsifier, it prevents fat and, and water from uh, separating out. Now, I'm not going to tell you that there's no issue with phosphates. In very high doses, it can affect the kidneys. Uh, we know this, there have been a number of studies that have been uh, done on this. However, <laughs> dosage matters. And the amount of phosphate that is found in the Cheerios is, is insignificant. In fact, if you eat a bite of meat, you're getting way, way, way more phosphates than you would ever get in a box of Cheerios. Phosphate is a natural building block of DNA. It's a natural building block of RNA. We are ingesting phosphates all the time. But the fact that in high doses, phosphates is used as a cleaning agent has no impact on its use in trivially small doses in, um, in cereals. But these days, of course, people are interested in these things. They're constantly producing labels, which is not a bad thing. I mean, obviously, we, we want to know what it is that, that uh, we are eating. And they are constantly looking for warnings. I, I mean, people will... Uh, happily buy stuff that is 100% chemical free. But if you're buying something that's 100% chemical free, you are not getting a good deal. Because the only thing that's chemical free is a vacuum. Everything in the world obviously is made of chemical. Chemical is not a dirty word. It is just a description of what our world is made of. These are the building blocks of, of matter. So something like that, 100% chemical free, is as absolute absurd uh, uh, advertising. But of course, it caters to chemophobia, the fear that people have of chemicals, which is usually quite irrational. Uh, chemicals are not good or bad. They are just things. It's people who can be good or bad, depending on how they use the uh, chemicals, right? Uh, I mean, we have numerous examples of that. Morphine can be a godsend when you're dealing with uh, terrible pain, but it can also put you to sleep permanently. It all depends on the dose and, and the context. But these days, people are certainly intrigued by food, and they're constantly asking questions about it, which is understandable. But you have to know where to go for answers. Unfortunately, when you go into bookstores these days, this is the kind of book that you get. Consumer's Dictionary of Food Additives with Ruth, written by Ruth Winter, who has absolutely no business writing such a book. So you may wonder how I dare to make a statement like that, you know, which is potentially libelous. Well, several reasons. First of all, we're not in the US. Uh, Second, uh, let's face it, the chance that she's in this room is pretty remote. 
Um, but most importantly, I think I can back it up scientifically. <coughs> so let me give you an example. Uh, for example, if you want to look up tertiary butyl hydroquinone or TBHQ in this book, which you might want to do because you can come across that as a food additive in a number of, of, of products, especially in frying oils. Um, whether you're buying uh, the oil in the supermarket or, or you're talking about uh, frying oil that is used in, in, in restaurants, there will be some TBHQ in there. And the reason for that is that it acts as what we call an antioxidant. Oils will eventually react with oxygen of the air and they become rancid. They, they get this off smell and this um, off taste. And obviously nobody wants that. So TBHQ is an antioxidant that will prevent that from happening. Obviously a manufacturer puts it in there because it serves a purpose. There's no company says, you know, uh, I don't think we've been spending enough of our pro on our product. Let's put in some TBHQ at our expense so that we can scare our customers and frighten them away, right? No company thinks like that. It's put in there because it serves um, serves a purpose, and and generally the purpose is is uh, of benefit to the uh, consumer because you don't want your oil to go rancid. All right. But you look up in this uh, book by Ruth Winter about TBHQ, and you find out that it is a form of butane or lighter fluid. And ingesting amounts as little as one gram can cause nausea, vomiting, ringing in the ears, delirium, a sense of suffocation, and collapse. That, of course, is true for butane. <laughs> uh, Butane is, is a gas, uh, it's, it's gas that, that uh, used in lighter fluids, uh, right? It burns very uh, well. And it sure sounds frightening when the description that, I've, with the description I just read, and, and you know, when you find out that this is in your food, you get all scared. But TBHQ is not butane. It, it, uh, does have a four carbon grouping in it, which is the, the butyl group, but it has nothing at all to do with butane, except that it shares part of the, the nomenclature. But uh, obviously this woman has no idea what she's talking about when she thinks that TBHQ is just another form of butane. It's not, the two are, are totally unrelated except for a little piece of the molecular structure that contains four, uh, four carbon atoms. Well, TBHQ is used in, in frying oil, so it does end up in food. So when you consume your chicken McNuggets, there is some of this chemical in there. But as I told you, any time that an additive is used, it has to have gone through all the regulatory hoops and hurdles. <clears throat> and the amounts that are allowed to be used are regulated. So for example, TBHQ is allowed in oils to the maximum of 0.02%, which is a vanishingly small amount, and uh, it is not going to have any kind of, of effect on anyone except to protect the oil from um, oxidation. And just to give you, put this into to proper context, you'd have to eat 313 nuggets to approach a toxic dose of one gram. Uh, and eating 313 pieces of chicken nuggets is, is quite a challenge, uh, even for lovers of chicken nuggets, and there actually is such a species out there. Um, but of course, this, this introduces the, the point that we talk about so often. First formulated 500 years ago by Paracelsus, who laid really the cornerstone of toxicology in that only the dose makes the poison. It makes no sense to talk about something being toxic or not without putting it into proper context. You have to know how much we're talking about and how that amount relates to a dose that we know is, is problematic. Anyway, uh, Chicken McNuggets have many opponents, including Joe Mercola, 
Now, let me tell you a little bit about this critter. Uh, Joe Mercola has been labeled as the most influential spreader of false information online by the New York Times. And the New York Times has some legitimacy as a publication. Uh, he was originally trained as an osteopathic physician. And in the US, uh, osteopathic physicians are real physicians, unlike in Canada. Here, osteopaths are uh, basically, you, you, get, you can get a diploma from a night, night course. Uh, but in the US, they actually are, are real physicians, but he hasn't practiced anything for 40 years. Well, I shouldn't say he hasn't practiced anything. He has practiced deluding people for 40 years. Uh, he is one of the biggest scammers, one of the biggest charlatans out there. <clears throat> he has made millions and millions of dollars from selling supplements, which are totally useless. Uh, he is um, what we would call the upside down doctor because he will oppose anything that traditional science promotes. Uh, he will turn everything upside down. In fact, we just got through putting out a one hour video on, on this ingrate and it's something that you can watch. You go to our website, which is mcgill.ca slash OSS and you'll be entertained by this one hour video and it will really enlighten you about the kind of people that are out there um, really on, uh, making money off the backs of people. And Joe Mercola is one of these. Anyway, he asked the question, what do McDonald's chicken McNuggets and silly putty have in common? Well, <laughs> what they have in common is really a common ingredient, which is a silicone. So in addition to the tertiary butyl hydroquinone, uh, there is silicone that is present in there. And the reason for that is because silicones are anti-foaming agents. And when you are using a frying oil, you don't want it to foam. And this is especially important in commercial fryers, right? So a tiny bit of silicone oil will prevent the foaming. And as I said, just like with any other food additive, the silicones have to be tested before they can be put into food. So these are <clears throat> regular food additives. And uh, again, you know, they've gone through all of the studies that are required. But silicones are also used to make silly putty. So of course, in, in Joe Mercola's twisted mind, if something is used to make silly putty, it should not be found in any food. Well, there's no such equation. I mean, just because you use something in one way doesn't mean that you can't use it in food. We wash our garages with water. It doesn't mean that you can't have water in, in food, right? I mean, that's just silly sort of thinking. And the fact is with silly putty, you could actually eat it. Uh, nobody's recommending that, right? But you could, because nothing dangerous about consuming silicones. And we know this because there's a commercial item that is totally based on silicones, which is very widely used. And these are these anti-gas agents for people who, who suffer from a lot of gas. And uh, uh, the silicones will counter that problem for the same reason that they counter the uh, problem in the oil. Uh, you don't want bubbles forming, right? So uh, this contains silicones in far, far higher concentration than you would find in, in frying oil. And nobody worries about giving people uh, mylanta in order to reduce their uh, gas formation in their, in their gut. Uh, anyway, a uh, number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago or so, I did write a column on this, on the whole business of McDonald's chicken, McDuggets, and, and you know, I, I, I explained everything very much like I explained it to, uh, to you here. And, uh, you know, I, I had some certainly negatives in there. I described that, uh, you know, the way that chick chickens are raised these days is, is not extremely appealing. You know, they're, you, they're raised in close confinement, uh, uh, etc. And um, that there, there are issues with uh, chicken McNuggets. And I pointed out what the real issues are. It's not the TBHQ. It's not the silicones. The problem is the calories. 
and there are a lot of calories in there and the sodium content is stunning, right? So that is the reason that you want to really limit your, your consumption of, uh, of chicken McNuggets, but they're not poison, right? I mean, they're survivable, uh, but yeah, you do have to watch the, the amount of fat, et cetera. So anyway, I wrote a column uh, about the pluses and, and the minuses. And uh, I get all kinds of feedback, and, and, but this, this column generated more feedback than, than usual. And uh, a lot of it was positive, saying, you know, that it's all well explained, et cetera. But there was a lot of abuse as well. Uh, from people who, you know, saying that I'm, I'm trying to poison the population by saying that that uh, these additives are, are are not dangerous and that that uh, I'm making uh, chicken McNuggets appealing, etc. And uh, really, the language is abusive. I mean, you know, uh, some of them questioned the marital status of my parents. Uh, it's a, you know, so some of them. Uh, uh, questioned my own chemical makeup uh, and, and saying that I was full of some substance, you know, uh, it was really very uh, abusive. And uh, so it, it kind of highlights, you know, that, that people are out there looking at the wrong things, believing the wrong things. And the fact is that um, facts will never open a locked mind. There are people out there, you know, whose mind is made up and you're never going to, to change that because they will, they will believe the most ridiculous things and uh, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. You know, I mean, uh, obviously we see this now all the time. There's no better example than what we're seeing in the US, right? I mean, the unbelievable things that this orange creature says uh, just boggles the mind. Uh, you know, uh, yesterday he was uh, pontificating about Arnold Palmer, how he got into this is totally bizarre, it was total non sequitur. And he goes on, out, on about how Arnold Palmer was a real man, and when he was taking a shower together with the other golfers after a game, they were all amazed by his equipment. And he wasn't talking about the golf clubs, you know? I mean, the, the, what can I tell you, the man is insane. All right, uh, some, um, some other noteworthy, interesting, confusing aspects of uh, uh, our consumption of foods and beverages. Uh, cola beverages, they're brown, right? You ever wondered why? Why had they're brown and, and how they're made brown? Well, the brown color is actually due to caramel. And caramel is burnt sugar. When you burn sugar, you actually form a large number of compounds. Some of them are in this family that we call melanoids, and those are the ones that give rise to the color, but there's a whole range of other compounds, including this one with the tongue-twisting name of 4-methylimidazole. And this is interesting because it actually, when fed to animals in large doses, it, it does cause problems. And this is why some of the activists have labeled Coca-Cola as toxic cola and that uh, when you're drinking it, you basically are committing suicide. Now, I'm no fan of Coca-Cola, okay? But I am a fan of good science, so let's analyze this. <clears throat> the 4-methylimidazole, when fed to test animals, indeed can produce a toxic reaction. It's a question of dose. So what is the dose? We actually know this. 12 ounce can of cola contains about 130 micrograms of this stuff. And uh, that means that <laughs> translates to 10 to 100,000 cans of cola consumed per person per day. And again, even the greatest cola lovers, uh, I think would be reviled by such, uh, such consumption. So once again, you know, the dose matters. But if you don't use the right words, uh, you can make it sound very scary because you can tell people, look, they're putting a carcinogen into Coca-Cola. Well, technically that's true, except that the amount is, is vanishingly small and it's irrelevant. There's a much better reason to stay away from Coke. 
And that, of course, is the massive sugar content. A can contains about 40 grams of sugar. That's about as much sugar as you should have at most in, in, in a day. But it tastes good, right? I mean, sugar makes the medicine go down. Mary Poppins told us that. If you can't trust Mary, who, you know, who can you trust? But uh, sugar also makes the pop go down. And this is one of the reasons why we are seeing the uh, obesity epidemic in North America. One of the major contributors to this is the, the tremendous consumption of soft drinks. And um, you know, something that I've said often, and I'm sure I've, I've said it here before, uh, if there's one thing that we could do in North America to put uh, the brakes on the runaway obesity epidemic, it would be to somehow control, if not eliminate, the consumption of soft drinks. They have no redeeming value. They have no nutritional merit. Uh, the only thing they do is deliver what we call empty calories. Uh, empty because there are no minerals, there's no antioxidants, nothing else that, that comes with it. Taste, I suppose. And uh, uh, I guess, you know, there's nothing wrong with enjoying it once in a while, uh, but that's not what North Americans do, uh, especially, you know, if you take a look at some of the sizes of the, the soft drinks, especially at amusement parks, which are especially attractive to obese people for some reason. But if you watch them, you know, sort of, of, of uh, walk around the amusement park holding these gigantic uh, cups of soft drink, which in Europe would serve as bathtubs, and, 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 and they are constantly guzzling uh, these things. Well, of course, it's not only soft drinks that are responsible for the uh, overweight epidemic. There is also a lot of uh, food, heavy calorie food that, are, uh, that is, is consumed. But um, this gives us uh, a way to talk about another very interesting story. Uh, so let me introduce you to Jamie Oliver, the British chef whose number of shows on, on TV and writes books. And I have to tell you, I actually like Jamie. I, I think he's very good on, on TV. Uh, he mostly says the right things, he promotes the right foods, but not in the right way. So let me tell you this. Well, first of all, why is he called the naked chef? It's not because he enjoys cooking in this particular fashion. Uh, I guess it, 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 is, it is supposed to mean that he gives you the bare information. All right. Well, he is uh, uh, certainly interesting in, in the way that he gets on TV, gets on radio, etc. And a few years ago, he was on with Letterman, when Letterman still had his, uh, his evening show. And he was talking food, he was talking cooking, he was showing David how to cook certain things. And at one point, Letterman was absolutely horrified. Why? Because Jamie had just served him a Sunday and told him that he had just consumed some beaver glands. And this horrified him. Well, what is the truth here. Beavers are very interesting animals and they actually have a scent gland which is near their their anus and uh, this scent gland produces a smell which in a concentrated uh, solution is is a very disturbing smell. I mean it, it doesn't smell nice. However when you dilute it it becomes a pleasant tasting uh, uh, concoction and pleasant smelling concoction. And uh, its chemistry has been analyzed. We know the con kind of compounds that are in there. And these compounds in the laboratory can actually be converted to vanillin. Now vanillin is the active ingredient, of course, in the vanilla bean. And natural vanilla is extracted from the vanilla bean, or in fact, you can buy the vanilla bean and, and, and you can uh, cook with it. 
but vanilla is very expensive. It is possible to make vanillin in the laboratory. And when you do that, it is exactly the same as what you can extract from the bean because properties depend on molecular structure. They don't depend on ancestry. It doesn't matter if it was made in the lab or it was made in the vanilla bean. The question is, what is it? So indeed it is possible to convert these compounds in castorium, which is this extract of the beaver gland, it's possible to make them into vanillin. And it has been shown, there were scientific papers published on that showing how this could be done. But no manufacturer does that. That was just of academic interest to show the relationship. You know? I mean, it, it would be ludicrous to, 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 to think that you would synthesize vanillin for the commercial market from beaver gland uh, extract. It's absolute nonsense. But it is true that in theory, you could make vanillin from there. So anyway, Jamie portrayed this as if the vanilla in the ice cream that Letterman had just consumed came from beaver glands, which of course is total nonsense. But you know what, even if it did come from beaver glands, so what? I mean, it's uh, our mouth waters at the thought of eating the rear end of a cow right, which is just steak. So what, what would be wrong with eating something from a beaver, right? Anyway, that, it was just nonsense. Now, to, to, to be fair though, I mean, Jamie does do a lot of good. He does teach children how to eat the right things. Uh, he has tried to revise the fare in cafeterias in, in, um, in North America as well as in, in, in Britain. So anyway, you know, he was telling David Letterman about the beaver glands in, in the Sunday, but he wasn't finished with that. He was then going to tell him about all the other horrific things that were in that Sunday as well. For example, shellac. Well, where was the shellac? in the coating on the candies that he had sprinkled on the, uh, on the ice cream. And indeed, it is true that shellac is used as a coating on, on candies, it's used as a coating on jelly beans, etc. Now, of course, most people are familiar with shellac as the stuff that you use to varnish furniture. So here we have this other situation where you can make it sound horrific by saying that they're putting the same thing that you're putting on your furniture in your candies. Well, shellac is actually a natural exudate of a bug. Uh, lives on uh, branches of, of trees, and it secretes this resin, and that resin uh, can be processed into, into shellac. But David is, uh, or uh, Jamie is telling uh, Letterman that, did you know that there are bugs in that ice cream, referring to the shellac. Well, of course, there are no bugs in there, but that didn't stop him from actually showing a bug and showing that this was in the ice cream. Totally ridiculous, but of course, it has an impact, a scary impact, and he still wasn't finished because he said there's more in that ice cream as he dumps in some hair and some feathers, okay? The story here is that this ice cream was supposedly cookie dough ice cream, and dough is often treated with cysteine, which is an amino acid. It's a dough conditioning agent. It allows the dough actually to have better texture. It's very common additive to, to, to dough. And it's a common amino acid. Cysteine is in virtually every protein that you eat. There's absolutely no issue with it. But it can be made from feathers or it can be made from hair because both of those are proteins. And if you take a protein and you break it down into its components, you get amino acids. And one of those amino acids is cysteine. And that can be used to condition dough. But there's no hair or duck feathers that are put into ice cream. It's nonsense to say that. 
uh, but you can make it sound very scary. You could, of course, you could also say that cysteine can be bought in any health food store where it is sold as a dietary supplement. But of course, that doesn't get said. So anyway, so Jamie was doing all of this. And he does this in schools as well. He goes into schools to do exactly the same demonstration. And then in one case, he calls up this poor little kid and just has done the demonstration where he was making the, the Sunday, put the feathers in there, put the bugs in there, and has that beaver forlornly looking by because his gonads have been used to put into the, into the ice cream. And uh, the kid is uh, obviously uh, horrified. And uh, Jamie tells him, you've just eaten human hair, duck feathers, crushed up bugs. And obviously, this scares all of the other students there. And then he finally punctuates this whole thing by saying, if you don't understand the crazy words that he used to talk about the chemicals in there, uh, then this was a good science class. No. This is monkey business, right? Um, it is total nonsense to suggest that when you're eating ice cream, you're eating hair and bugs and shellac, right? Because obviously he has not described this in, in the proper way. Yes, there is cysteine in there, which can be derived from hair or from feathers, but so what? It's no longer hair or feathers, it's completely purified material. Same thing for shellac, right? Uh, but it, you can see how easy it is to frighten people about the food that, that they eat. Now, if the point is to make them eat apples and oranges and bananas instead of that ice cream sundae, well, you know, maybe there is something to that. But you can do that in a much more elegant way without resorting to such uh, you know, sc scary nonsense. So uh, Jamie does indeed push towards a diet that has lots of fruits and vegetables for kids. That's true. But he does it by scaring them about some of the other foods that they eat. And giving false information is never right. So uh, there are much better ways to do this. Now, it is true that, that the North American diet is not what it should be. And there are a lot of questionable foods. I mean, do we really need Fruit Loops with every color of the rainbow? You know, do we need the jelly beans with every color of, of the rainbow? Well, let's for a moment forget about the content, which is, of course, mostly sugar in, in, in here, and refined carbohydrates in, in, in the cereal. So these are not your highly nutritious foods. But let's focus for a moment on the dyes, because those have been quite controversial, the, the, the food dyes. And uh, there are many uh, books like this that will tell you about you know, the artificial dyes that are used, and that uh, Today, most food coloring is made from coal tar and petroleum, same stuff used in lice shampoos and pavement sealant. Okay, another absurd analogy. Yes, it is true that food dyes, as well as many medications, cosmetics, and, and our clothes, numerous other items, are made from raw materials that derive from petroleum because petroleum is a mixture of many, many different compounds which have all kinds of potential uses in, in, in chemical synthesis. But you're not putting asphalt on your food when you're using a food dye. And so the fact that the food dye is made from the same stuff that asphalt is made from has no scientific uh, legitimacy. So once again, with food dyes, when industry wants to put them into a food, it has to submit data to Health Canada or in the States to FDA, and then authorities will decide whether or not those colors can be added to food 
and to which food and in what sort of amounts. Now, that being said, uh, I'm no fan of food dyes because they serve no purpose other than make the food look more appealing. And usually it is food that is not of high nutritional value that is made more appealing with, with the food dyes, right? They are not essential by any stretch of the imagination. We don't need these vibrant colors in, in our food. But what are they, some of the arguments that are used against the, this? One that I'm sure that you've heard is that food dyes drive kids into hyperactive behavior, that it causes attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, etc. Uh, this allegation uh, started with Dr. Benjamin Feingold way back in the 1970s uh, with his uh, contention that uh, food dyes and some other additives uh, cause uh, hyperactivity in children and that if you just put the kids on a diet without these additives, you convert them into nice, well-behaved little kids. Well, it isn't quite like that, but neither is this a totally scientifically bankrupt idea because there have been some studies, the one that is most often uh, talked about is this one, uh, which was uh, done in England at the University of Southampton, and, and it's called the Southampton Study ever since then. It goes back to 2007, where they actually did a double-blind trial where they gave kids certain food dyes and uh, sodium benzoate, which is a preservative, and then monitored their behavior. And uh, they did uh, find that the behavior did become more active when they were eating foods that were uh, dyed. It's not quite a straightforward study because uh, most of the information came from the parents who documented whether the kids were more or, or less active. However, the parents knew when the kids were getting the, the dye. But anyway, it, it's possible that there is something um, to this hyperactivity thing. Um, on the other hand, as I said before, the dyes are generally used in foods that you shouldn't be encouraging kids to eat anyway. But the other contention, and the one that gets uh, a lot of traction in the alarmist press, is the allegation that these food dyes are linked to, to cancer. And the one that is attacked mostly is red dye number three, or erythrocin, uh, for example, which is used in, in uh, uh, pistachios. Incidentally, pistachios are never that color, right? Uh, it's a very interesting reason why pistachios are, are colored. Uh, when pistachios were introduced into North America, they were sold in these machines, the same machine that, that dispenses peanuts, you know, where, or gumballs where you turn the handle and you get a, a handful of the stuff. But uh, pistachios are much more expensive than peanuts. So when they were put into, into those machines, people said, what, what is this crazy? You have to put in two quarters, you know, where you have to only put a nickel into, into the peanut machine. So they thought that, you know, this, these were just expensive peanuts. So they colored them to distinguish them from peanuts, and they built a whole marketing campaign on, on the red pistachios. Um, uh, red dye number three is also used in, in uh, maraschino cherries. Now, when it was first uh, introduced as a, a potential uh, food additive, it had to be investigated. And there was reason to investigate it. The molecular structure of erythrocin looks like this, and it contains iodine. And any time that you're putting extra iodine in the body, you do want to be careful uh, because iodine concentrates in the thyroid gland, and it can interfere with the activity of the, the thyroid. So therefore, of course, they did examine it, and it turned out that it actually did cause thyroid tumor in male rats. But... Once again, they had to study the dose. And the dose was about uh, 
14,000 daily servings of fruit cocktail every day for 70 years to match the dose that caused the thyroid cancer in, in, in the animal. So again, it is really not uh, significant. Nevertheless, because of this concern, the industry switched to using a different dye for the maraschino cherries. And uh, they hyped this up as a natural dye, which indeed it is, because it is extracted from a tiny insect called the cochineal. These insects are raised on cacti, mostly in the southern US and in, in Mexico. And the female of the species produces a vibrant red color. Only the female produces it, the males do not. But the males are sacrificed for the beauty of the female. They're all gathered together, squashed, and uh, you get this red dye. And it's, as I said, it's a very, very uh, vibrant color that can be squeezed from the female insect. And uh, it is an approved dye. It is natural, and as you know, the word natural sells. And uh, so it was used in the uh, maraschino cherries to replace uh, erythrocin. Uh, Starbucks used it in their uh, strawberry flavored and colored uh, concoction. And that got uh, a lot of opposition because people were saying they're putting bugs into the strawberry drink. And uh, the company actually had to ditch the, the, the cochineal. People didn't want to drink it because it uh, had this bug extract. Total nonsense, again, because the cochineal is safe. Uh, nothing, of course, can be guaranteed to be 100% safe in, in, in everyone. For example, there are people who can have an allergic reaction to this. There are people who can have allergic reactions, of course, to numerous food components. Uh, red lipstick is very often dyed with, with cochineal. And there are some people who do have an allergic reaction to, to this. I had a case like that that I consulted on many years ago when every Friday, a little boy would come home from school and he would have a rash on his face. And the parents couldn't figure out what it was. And it was only on Friday. Well, then, of course, started to asking what is the difference on Friday compared to other, any other day. The difference was that on Friday, he was picked up from school by his grandmother. And of course, the grandmother kissed him on the cheek, and it turned out that he did have an allergic reaction to the, the, uh, the cochineal. So there are a lot of uh, dyes that, that are used, synthetic dyes. And they are very, very vibrant colors, which of course is the reason that the industry likes them, because this attracts kids. Kids like these highly colored things. But today, because of the concern about synthetic substances, uh, because in so many minds the word synthetic equates to dangerous and natural equates to safe. This is, of course, a nonsensical equation. You cannot tell anything about the safety or the benefit of a substance by its ancestry. It doesn't matter if it was made by Mother Nature in a plant or by a chemist in a lab. What matters is what it is and how much you have studied it. In any case, there is now a movement towards natural dyes. And there are natural dyes, and uh, some of them can be pretty good. Uh, all the ones here are uh, natural, the ones on top are synthetic. There is no good natural blue. And uh, people want blue in their Smarties, they want blue in their M&Ms, and they're disappointed when they're uh, not there. Uh, but it is true that the chance of having a, a reaction to one of the natural dyes is actually less than the, to the synthetic. That, that turns out to be correct. And in Europe, uh, they have gone totally towards um, the natural dyes. So, for example, uh, as you can see, the same product in Europe uh, uses uh, beetroot, uh, anato, which is, uh, comes from the seeds of a tropical plant, paprika e extract, whereas the same 
concoction in North America, as you can see, uses the synthetic dyes. The synthetic dyes are cheaper to produce and they give you a more intense color. But we don't really need those intense colors. We don't need the, the colors at all. The Smarties and the M&Ms will taste exactly the same, no matter how they are dyed, or even if they are not dyed, you know? But of course, we have been conditioned that your M&Ms should come in a rainbow of colors, and so should your uh, Smarties. So as you can see, there, there's a lot of very interesting science, and, uh, and there are a lot of you know, interesting stories behind all of the food that, that we eat. And uh, additives very often uh, are the weapons that the alarmists use to scare people uh, for all the reasons that I, I, I told you, you know, suggestions that they're putting phosphates, which are a cleaning agent in your, in your cereal, or they're putting butane into your, your oil, none of which, of course, are scientifically sound. However, uh, if it all translates to getting people to eat a healthier diet, that is to eat more fruits and more vegetables, uh, great, because our diet in North America uh, is, is not very good. Uh, we should be eating five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables you know, on a daily basis, and that unfortunately is not happening. The average serving of fruits and vegetables in North America is two, and that counts French fries as a vegetable. And that's a pretty sad uh, state of uh, things. So, you know, when, when Jamie scares people away from all of the processed foods, it has some merit if it drives people towards eating a healthier diet, but Still, it should not be done by these illegitimate uh, scares. And to be frank, I mean, if you want to look at this healthy plate, uh, and if you're gonna take a look at it, you know, through the chemical magnifying glass, you find that the radishes contain goitrogens. They interfere with the way the thyroid gland works. So you can't really have those either. And the cheese, contains tyramine. Tyramine can lay, raise blood pressure. So if you really want to be safe, you can't have that either. But you still have a lot of good stuff, but those oranges contain tangeritin, which is toxic to rat embryos, so you can't have, have that. But we're still okay until you take a look at the celery, which also contains goitrogens, and the uh, carrots, they contain myristicin, which is a hallucinogen, and you don't want to have anything to do with that, and that the banana contains serotonin, which can result in serotonin syndrome, uh, which is an unpleasant sensation. So let's get rid of that. And uh, we're still left with that apple, and you've heard that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, which it may do if you throw it at him or her, uh, but that apple also contains cyanide in the seeds. And cyanide, of course, is highly toxic, so we can't have that. So we are left with the plate, right? Which you can't eat either because it is coated with nickel, uh, which is a toxic metal. Of course, everything that I told you here is nonsense, and let's put all of those foods back because they're great to eat, even though everything that I just told you is true but the amounts, of course, are so small. We don't have to worry about the apples because the amount of cyanide that you would get in uh, the seeds of one apple is, is insignificant. So uh, what's the moral here is, yeah, we should stay away from all of those highly processed foods, not necessarily because of the additives, but because they tend to be not very nutritious. They tend to be high in fat, they have they tend to be high in sugar, they tend to be high in salt. That's the better reason. We don't need things like deep fried Twinkies, right? Uh, but these kind of monstrosities are out there and we need to gravitate away from them and go towards the naturally colored fruits and vegetables. 
right? Because these are the ones that, that do promote health and that's what we should have in a balanced diet. But just as one final point here to make is that, well, we just spent an hour talking about some interesting aspects of food and talking about what we shouldn't eat and worried about traces of toxins in caramel and phosphate in our cereal. Let's just remember that a third of the world goes to bed hungry every night and they would be very happy to have our additive laden food. So here in North America, we have the luxury of talking about trivia, right? Uh, but a lot of people would be very, very happy to eat the, the uh, additive chemical laden food that we have in our supermarkets. All right, that's it. Uh, remember, you can, um, you can always check out more of the stuff that we have on our website and you can sign up for a weekly newsletter and get updates on, on everything. All right, questions? What I'm gonna talk about in November, chance favors the prepared mind. Yeah. <laughs> Could I elaborate on cosmetics? Yeah, that, that's a whole semester full of lectures. Okay. Um, cosmetics do not undergo the same kind of, of um, regulatory challenges as food. They're differently regulated. They do not have to show before they put, they're put on the market, they do not have to show safety. Okay. Now that sounds terrible except that it really isn't because the cosmetics industry is scared to death of putting something out there that is going to cause an adverse reaction. This is the Democles sword that hangs over their head, especially in the US where class action lawsuits are so easy to mount. So while they don't have to prove safety, they actually have the so-called cosmetics regulatory panel, which is an industry panel with some FDA uh, input. And they are very scrupulous about what they put into cosmetics. So uh, I, I'm not gonna tell you that it's impossible to have a reaction, of course it is. I mean, you, you know, people can have allergic reactions to anything. But the biggest problem with cosmetics is not safety. The biggest problem with cosmetics is that they are overhyped and uh, you know they they overpriced and uh, they don't deliver you know what the advertising says yeah uh i i could with some difficulty uh it, it is a very complex it, the, the chemist nobel prize was for something called microRNA. Now, uh, most people have heard of RNA, mostly messenger RNA, because that, that is the, the, really the essence of vaccines. Uh, but um, uh, microRNA is also a type of messenger inside of, of cells, and it uh, tells the cell what proteins to make. Uh, at this point, you know, uh, I mean, I, to tell you honestly, it's extremely complicated science, the microRNA. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that eventually it is going to allow uh, cells to be given instructions from the outside by, by scientists about what kind of proteins they, they should manufacture. And that, that can have uh, possibilities in pharmaceuticals, it can have possibilities in, in, in nutrition. Uh, but microRNA is not one of the easy concepts to to explain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the 
uh, it's still caramel, but the, the amount of caramel that you need in order to give you the color has no caloric uh, value. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has what? Carrageenan. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, you know, if you look at the alarmist literature, they will tell you that carrageenan is, you know, <laughs> constructed by the devil in hell. Uh, carrageenan is extracted from seaweed, and uh, it's used uh, as an emulsifier. It prevents, again, it prevents fat and water from separating. Uh, it is very rare to have an allergic reaction to it. Not impossible, but rare. Uh, what, what, what can I tell you? I mean, in the vast majority of the population, carrageenan would have absolutely no, no effect. Yeah. Anything that's burned is not good, okay? Uh, so whether it's, uh, you know, uh, burned chicken or burned bread or burned toast, uh, the trouble is that it, it contains a number of nasty compounds, of which acrylamide is probably the, the most noteworthy one, but there are others as well. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of epidemiological evidence uh, about uh, People who eat a lot of, of dark colored foods have indeed do have a higher incidence of cancer. Yes, yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's not a, a science isn't white or black, it's shades of gray, or in this case, shades of brown, you know. So it depends on how 